let's see. This race is next, first and third Sunday, 8 p.m., W5FC. I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. Visible 
Kilo Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra, Billy Sherman. And Taiwai O, which is November 5, Yankee Echo Oscar, Stephen, San Antonio, keeping warm. Kilo India 5, Bravo November Papa, Luis in Fort Worth. Hey, Louise, say it again for her in 5YL. Hey, Louise, Sorry, that's Kilo India 5, Bravo November Papa. Please, forward. Bravo November Papa with Luis. Very good. Any other check in to the Whiskey 5, Echo, Bravo, Bravo, David in Dallas. Go ahead. And here 
I'm, I'm bringing it up now from the uh, Dallas Amateur Radio Club site. Usually Tony will do this on Saturday, but he's out sick. So let's see here. Uh, he has, did put post these up. Don't forget that we have the Winter Field Day coming up this coming weekend next Saturday. You can sign up and participate using the form that's available on the W5FC.org website. Actually, it's a link to the Mars website, KB5A.org. Uh, there are three groups involved with it. Uh, that would be the uh, Mars Metro Crest Club, the Irving Amateur Radio Club, and the Dallas Amateur Radio Club. We will be working out of the uh, one of the uh, former um, fire stations over in uh, Carrollton. Uh, I've been there. In fact, I lived uh, no more than about 300 feet from that station. I've been there a number of times, so it's kind of nice. It's all set up, uh, and it'll be comfortable. We won't be in the cold. We'll be inside. So if you'd like to come by, uh, it will go throughout the day. If you want to get additional information, by all means, check W5FC.org, and you'll get all the uh, information there. And there's more. There is in the world of contesting, there is the uh, single sideband edition of the North American CUSO party that is going on this weekend, as is the National Collegian Club Championship in the ARRL January VHF contest. I think that's it from there, uh, he's got some other announcements. I think that showed up in the earlier stuff. So uh, that's it for me right now. I'll give you the Afterglow movie stuff here in a bit. This is KE5ICX, back now.
So if you want to comment about the second one, you may do so. That's it, 10.30 p.m. Uh, back to you, Net Control, KE5 ICX. Thanks very much, Tom. Okay, we have a information about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas and their events where where and when you can look through a telescope. Um, they, uh, their monthly meetings are held on the fourth Friday of every month, except December. These are at the University of Texas at Dallas campus in Richardson. The meeting starts at 7.30 p.m. in the Science Learning Center building. That's SLC on the campus map. Only park in lots H, I, or J. Parking anywhere else on campus can result in a ticket. And um, so you can go to their website for uh, a campus map. The meetings in, uh, include programs presented by members or guest speakers, a slideshow of the current constellation of the month, and items for sale, such as teachers, books, and observing aids. You can find more about TAS of Dallas at texasastro.org. T-E-X-A-S-A-S-T-R-O.org. Um, is anyone on frequency who would like to talk about it or whether there is an observing party anywhere tonight? Um, they have them every Saturday night, but of course, um, weather, they cancel for weather. If you go to sastro.org, this, this section calendar and the pull down for, for uh, details. So, anybody have any information on that? located at 1206 West FM 1382 in Cedar Hill. Uh, they start viewing at around 6 uh, p.m. Of course, it's 9 now. I, I don't know if they're still out there. It's pretty cold. Uh, but it shows the event going from, well, <laughs> never mind, it's already over. I, I see it's appended here down here. It says date and time, January 19th from 6 to 9 p.m. They do have a website that you can go to as well as a telephone number. So, sorry, I guess they're done for the evening. I'll bet you they are really done because it's windy and cold out there. But if you do go to the Texas Astronomical Society event calendar, this is actively updated. They will let you know if um, an event is canceled or if it's on, and it will give you the times for that particular night. So it's actively updated. That's at texasastro.org. Back to you, ke 5 i 6 um, okay, National Space Society events and activities. N5BB, do you have anything for us, Bill? Uh, let me know. 
Okay, the, the last, this is uh, part two of the nature of light. Last week, uh, we discussed the, the different philosophers over the centuries, uh, starting with Aristotle, and they all had ideas of what the light ought to be. Uh, Newton believed the light was made of different colored particles. That was just sort of a guess. It wasn't one of his most astute insights into things. But he was partially right. Uh, his contemporary, a Dutch mathematician and astronomer, Christian Huygens, disagreed with Newton and stated that light was actually a wave. Uh, Thomas Young, a little bit later, performed the, the so-called uh, double slit experiment. Now, this experiment is probably done by every uh, first or second semester physics student. And Tom has a video up there now. And, and uh, we'll talk in detail or in depth about how this works in a few minutes here. But basically, if you have two different sets of waves, they're going to have like nodes, or, which is the center, and then they're going to have like peaks, and they're going to have valleys, the troughs. And if, if a peak, two peaks coincide, you're going to get a double peak, basically. And if two if these troughs or valleys coincide with each other, you're going to get a double valley. And if a peak and a valley coincide with each other, that's a null, basically, and you won't get anything because the two will, can, will cancel each other out. Well, now, this has been known with water waves. It was already well known and was ac ac you know, accurately studied with mechanical waves for a long time. This is well known. Well, we also know that light ex exhibits the exact same char characteristic behavior in the double slit experiment. So this seemed to prove the theory uh, of light was a wave versus the theory that it was a particle, that interpretation. Uh, now, now, further insights in the nature of light came from James Clerk Maxwell, who's one of my all-time favorite people, actually, is, that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves, and he came up with these things called Maxwell's equations, which are the foundation of modern electromagnetism. Uh, they're a very, a set of very four elegant equations that hold true for electromagnetic waves in general. Now, if you study this stuff, uh, you can say there's really eight, but it doesn't matter because they, they, they can be all boiled down to uh, into four. Uh, basic concepts, and I'm not really, really going to get into too much into these because they're basically uh, partial differential equations, and that's kind of beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But he, he did show a connection between light and and uh, magnetic fields to produce electromagnetic waves when it was shown that electromagnetic waves propagated exactly the same speed of light. So, basically the issue must be settled for all. Light must either be an oscillating field propagating throughout space like a wave, and this is accepted as an undeniable fact for a long time. Only one problem remained, what is the medium through which light is supposed to travel? Uh, water waves, sound waves, or material waves use respectively water, air, or solid body as a medium of propagation. So, since light can also travel through empty space, this led to the conclusion that empty space must, must continue some kind of unknown substance, the so-called luminiferous ether, that could function as a, prop, as a propagation medium for light and other electromagnetic waves. And uh, I, I talked once before, uh, some time back, about how Michelson and Morley performed their famous experiment to prove the existence of this luminif luminous, luminous, luminiferous ether. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't, they never proved anything because it was found out later there was no such thing, but Michelson, uh, he sort of gave up on it and went on to other things and to the end of his life, believe that he, cons he considered himself a failure because he could never find this luminous, luminiferous either. So this is often called the most famous experiment uh, that failed. Okay, 
me get into a little bit the Maxwell's equations because I think this is really cool. Uh, in the reboot of Cosmos, uh, remember uh, uh, the guy that presented it. Uh, his name evades me for a second, but uh, he was asked if he could. Uh, why he never talked about Maxwell's equations? Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I think of. He never talked about uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, one of the most uh, important discoveries of all times. And he said, well, if I would have done that, I would have lost my audience. They'd all flipped over to Wheel of Fortune or something like that. So I'm not going to get into any level of detail here, but uh, we'll go back a few years to uh, a fellow named Michael Faraday. And Faraday was from kind of humble beginnings, and he was never really well educated in the sense that he didn't have a whole lot of schooling. Uh, he, uh, his his uh, mathematics abilities probably were no more than simple algebra, which means he maybe he got through the ninth grade. But he was he became a valet to a, a chemist named uh, Sir Humphrey Davy, and Sir Humphrey took him on as an assistant. Uh, where he uh, did a lot of work in chemistry. Uh, for instance, uh, Faraday, it, you know, his, his name gives us the word Farad, which is our unit of capacitance. But Faraday, when he was working uh, as an assistant to Davy, is uh, attributed to uh, discovering calcium and carbon. Uh, also, he refused to work on chemical weapons during the Crimean War because he knew that chlorine was nasty stuff. But he was better known on his work regarding electricity and magnetism. And this is important. Faraday showed how a changing magnetic field induces an electromotive force, or you could say a voltage, in, in, uh, resulting in an electric current. He did this in the early to middle part of the 18th century, 19th century. Now, Maxwell developed a set of equations that would hold true for all electromagnetic, electromagnetic interactions, and while doing this, he predicted the existence of magnetic waves. Now, Faraday intuitively understood this, but he, it wasn't until Maxwell came along where he could actually quantify it. But Maxwell had the tools uh, that Faraday didn't have, the, the math tools. So, uh, I was going to talk about Maxwell's field equations, which can really spin your head around. Uh, let's see, that would be the next slide there, Tom. But Maxwell's field equations, let me pull up mine here. Okay, there they are, Tom's got them up. Maxwell's field equations are originally written, they were written in an integral form by Maxwell, but around uh, 1900 or so, uh, there was another form of mathematics was, was created called uh, vector calculus by uh, one, of the, one of the developers of it was a guy named Oliver Heaviside. And, and Heaviside was uh, known because, or pretty, pretty well known because he uh, discovered the ionosphere. In fact, he used to call it the E-layer, uh, where we get sporadic E-skip in the spring of the year. He, he, uh, that was that E-skip, that E-layer was what's called the heaviside layer. And if you ever remember the, the musical Cats, the uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, there's a lot of songs and stuff about the heaviside layer, which is like Cat Heaven, you know, and the Jellicle Ball, and old Deuteronomy was going to the heaviside layer. So he was kind of the rock star as such back around that time. So uh, what we see here that Tom has up are not the integral forms, but they're the the uh, vector calculus forms. And, and they, have, they have kind of a strange notation, and I'm not even sure if, ma if most mass mathematicians really know about this stuff, because it's really a specialized case. But you see the first one is kind of like an upside down triangle. That's called a NAMBLA, and basically uh, it just refers to, this is like a three-dimensional multivariable calculus.
description of, of, of what it is. But the, it's called a del, del dot E. The, the del dot is, is, is like what they call the dispersion operator. And all, all it basically says is, is del dot E is a uh, says, uh, that the flex to an enclosed surface is proportional to the total charge enclosed by the surface. And what that means is if you got a charge, there's going to be an electro, like an electric field associated with it. Uh, for example, if you have a cat, and on a dry day you rub the cat, the cat gets charged up, and his hair sticks up. Well, the, the cat is the is the charged object, and in in the hair produces this electric field, and, and that's all that means. If you have a charge in space, you have an electric field. Okay, the second equation is sort of based on the work of Gauss, and that's the del dot V equals zero. And what that really means is there are no monopoles. With the magnetic field, you're always going to have a positive and negative. There are no monopoles. There are no tripoles. You always have a dipole. Okay, but the next two equations are the ones that I think are really cool. The third equation is Faraday's law, and, and this is, like I said, quantified what Faraday actually knew intuitively. I'm getting really close to time here, so I'm going to wrap this up really quick. But that equation says that there's a connection between a magnetic flux and an induced electric field. And you notice it's, it's really a derivative because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're looking at that magnetic, the change in the magnetic field over a change in time. And that means that it's a moving magnetic field. A static magnetic field won't do anything. It has to be constantly changing. So the third equation is, shows the connection between a changing magnetic field and an induced electric field. And the fourth equation is just sort of the reverse. The del cross B, the, the, the del cross E and the del cross B. The del cross is uh, what they call the curl operator. And if you, if you say, hold your palm out and put a pencil in your palm, it will say this pencil is a conductor or a wire carrying, carrying electric current. Your thumb points to the direction of the current flow. And if you hold, your cur if you curl your fingers around the pencil, your fingers are going to curl, as they say, in the right-hand direction, and that's going to be the magnetic field, which goes from uh, positive, from the north to the south pole. So that's called the curl operator, and so what that says is that a changing electric flux, in other words, current moving through this wire that you have in your hand, is going to produce a... Uh, magnetic field that's going to be perpendicular to the direction of current flow. And, and these are really important because Faraday's third law is like the secondary of a transformer. You have a changing magnetic field is going to produce current in the secondary winding of the transformer. The, uh, his fourth law is just the reverse. You have an electric field going into the primary of a transformer and, and that's going to change, and that's going to create a, ch uh, a changing magnetic field, which is going to be coupled to the secondary. Now it's important that this is um, a changing electric field. If it's just a DC or DC field, you're going to burn out the primary and your transformer. So it, this all requires the field to be changing. Okay, I'm down to my last 30 seconds. So I'm going to wrap it up here real quick. These oscillations are electromagnetic waves. Well, let's see, let me go back up. If, if, if a changing electric field is generated when a magnetic field is induced, and this results in a changing magnetic field, and that, that in turn induces an electric field, so the electric field generates a magnetic field, a magnetic field uh, induces a changed electric field. There's my clock going off. So basically what happens is the energy is constantly being swapped time out here between the electric and the magnetic fields.
I get swapped out. I get uh, tagged out here, Tom. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I thought I timed out the repeater. Anyway, you have an electric field that contain that, that induces a magnetic field. The magnetic field induces an electric field, and, and so on. And these oscillations are electromagnetic waves, uh, which are made up of changing magnetic and electric fields that travel through space. And basically, that is why we don't need an ether because it's the electromagnetic waves. The electric and the magnetic fields that are their, their own medium. You don't need any third ether or, or an additional ether. Okay, now uh, I have an example of this, but I think I'm going to wait till next week because I've used up my 15 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions or any maybe comments from N5BB, uh, I guess we can take them and then move on to the next topic. So back to that. Thank you, Brenda, KG5P. Thank you very much, Mike. That was fascinating. Okay, let's circle back. Uh, N5BB was not there when I called a while ago. Uh, Bill, are you here now with any information on the Tex Texas Astronomical no, uh, no, Texas Space Society? Hi, Brenda. This is N5BB. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to leave for just a moment. And, uh, of course, that must have been the moment when you called me. <laughs> Uh, the National Space Society of North Texas uh, had their January meeting this last Sunday, uh, June the 13th, excuse me, January the 13th in Irving. <clears throat> and the main topic uh, was just discussion about all of the current um, projects that intend to be, are planned to be launched here in the next year or two. And there's many, many things uh, that plan to be launched by NASA and SpaceX, International Space Alliance, and some other organizations. Um, so we talked about those kinds of things. Um, and there, there is probably going to be, well, the, the group decided that they were not going to have a regional uh, conference here uh, this spring, <clears throat> but in 2020 there will be a national conference that will be hosted here in the DFW area uh, for the National Space Society. Um, and I think that's it. I just don't really have a lot of other detailed information right now collected up. This is in 5 bb um, Very good. Okay, do we have any additional check-ins? Is Whiskey, Bravo. Number four, Mike Foxtrot, India, W, B, four, M, F, I, Ted, low power, Dallas. Okay, W, B, four, M, F, I, welcome to the net, Ted. Okay, um, our next segment is what can you see in the sky over the next couple of weeks? And uh, this will be presented by KE5 ICX. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. This is KE5 ICX. Uh, this week, I'm not the big brain, but somebody else is, earthsky.org forward slash tonight. They've got all the information there. They do have a chart. By the way, if you want to check, we do have charts up. It's kind of hard to imagine constellations unless you're really good at it by checking the charts or watching the video feed. So east at nightfall is what they're pointing to at the website, and they say the following about Gemini. On January 19, 2019, the moon will look full to you, but it's not yet. The full moon comes when the moon is most opposite the sun. That will be January 20th. 
For us in North America, at which time the full super moon will be totally eclipsed by the Earth's dark shadow for 62 minutes, starting at 11.41 p.m. Eastern Time. At 10.41 p.m. Central Time, that's us. And I don't, you don't want to know about all the others, but anyway, it's there. And I'll give you some more information on the lunar eclipse, total lunar eclipse coming up. And anyway, meanwhile, the January 19th moon is a waxing gibbous moon. It's near the bright stars Castor and Pollux in the constellation Gemini the Twins. Although we've been drawn in the stick figure, uh, although we've draw, we're drawn in by the stick figure of the Gemini Twins on the chart, uh, you might not see much of Gemini in the moonlight glare except for Castor and Pollux. These two stars are bright and noticeable for being near one another. They form the northeastern part of the winter circle. The brilliant star on the other side of the January 19th moon is uh, Procyon, I hope I got that right, sometimes called the little dog star. You might not know about this star, these three stars, but they offer an alternate way of finding Polaris, the North Star. You can draw an imaginary line from Procyon, and then in between the two Gemini stars and take a long jump northward to locate Polaris, the North Star. Oh, that's a new one. Star hopping, you are familiar with the constellation Orion and the line of three stars known in Orion's belt. So you can star hop to the Gemini stars Castor and Pollux, as also shown in, a, in the uh, chart. Let's see here. Oh my goodness, they got all sorts of things. Okay, let me throw that one up. Uh, there's another east mid evening star. It says, so on the bottom, uh, the bottom line is on the evening of January 19, 2019, let the full looking waxing gibbous moon guide your eye to the bright Gemini stars, Castor and Pollux. Well, ain't that interesting. That was a really short report. Let me go back to the total lunar eclipse and let's see what they got there. There's a hot link on the website. I did not put this into the notes. So on January 20th, 21st, we'll have the first full moon of 2019 and the first lunar eclipse of 2019. And this is an eclipse heavy year with three solar eclipses and two lunar eclipses that can be viewed from North and South America, Greenland, Iceland, Europe, North and Western Africa, plus the Arctic regions of the globe. More details and eclipse times for North America, plus links for those elsewhere are below. And this is EarthSky.org, by the way. The eclipse will happen on the night of the year's first and three straight full super moons, meaning the moon will be nearly at its closest to Earth for this January as the eclipse takes place. Many are calling it the blood moon. Why? We're not entirely sure, but you can read more about it. Boy, they just got the links here. Many are calling it the blood moon. Oops, uh, there's, now there's a single and sad last thing. Last thing, this will be the last total lunar eclipse to grace Earth's sky until May 26, 2020, what? 2021? Are you kidding me? All right, this is what they've got for us, Central Time, uh, Partial Umbral, uh, eclipse begins at 9.34 p.m. on January 20th. The total lunar eclipse begins at 10.41 on January 20th. The great, greatest eclipse, 11.12 p.m. Total lunar eclipse ends at 11.43, and then the partial umbral eclipse ends at 12.51. You guessed it on January 21st. Want to find out additional information? Uh, looks like if you go to timeanddate.com, those are the words time, the word and, A and D, date.com, forward slash eclipse, they will give you detailed information on the eclipse occurring tomorrow. So uh, there you have it. I think uh, 
I'm going to end it there. There is some additional information here, but yeah, I think we're good. So, uh, I'll, I'll send this back to net control. This is KE5 ICX back to net control. Planet was first suggested 
1982, long before the necessary observations were possible. Co-author Mark Marley, now at NASA's AIDS Research Center, Silicon Valley, subsequently flushed out the idea for his PhD thesis in 1990, showing how the calculations could be done, predicted where features in Saturn's rings would be. He also noted that the Cassini mission, then on the planning stages, would be able to make the observations needed to test the data. Two decades later, people looked at the Cassini data and found ring features at the locations of Mark's predictions, Portnoy said. Italy 
reported their results today in the journal Science. Do rings come from icy comets? Earlier estimates of the matter that the Saturn's rings between one half and one third the mass of uh, uh, Mimus come from studying the density waves that travel around the rocky icy rings. These waves are caused by the planet's 62 satellites, including Mimus, which creates the so-called Cassini division between the two largest rings, A and B. Mimus is moving around 246 kilometers in diameter. It has a big impact crater that makes it resemble the Death Star from the Star Wars movies. Uh-oh. People don't trust the wave measurements because there might be particles in the rings that are massive. They're not participating in the waves, no one sure said. We always suspected there was some hidden mass that we could not see in the waves. Luckily, as Cassini approached the end of its life, NASA programmed it to perform 22 dives between the planet and the ring to probe Saturn's gravity field. Earth-based radio telescopes measured the spacecraft's velocity to within a fraction of a millimeter per second. The new ring mass value is in the value of the range of earlier estimates and allows researchers to determine their age. These age calculations, led by Philip Nicholson of Cornell University and Les, and an IAS, built on a connection that scientists had previously made between the mass of the rings and their age. Lower mass points to a younger age because the rings are initially made of ice and are bright but over time become contaminated and darkened by interplanetary debris. These measurements were only possible because the Cassini flew so close to the surface in its final hours, and all of said it was a classic, spectacular way to end the mission. Okay, this is Daddy V5OZL. Do we uh, have any more check-ins? Controllers plan some very short drives called bumps to 
to allow more pictures of the wheels to be taken. Uh, there's no impact on the science operation or the rover's or, or the rover's lifetime uh, is expected. Now this week in history, he's got a couple of things here. January 14, 2005, the Hygens uh, probe launched, lands successfully on Titan, uh, moon of Saturn. Hygens was an atmospheric entry probe that landed successfully on Saturn's moon Titan in 2005. Gosh, it's been that long ago. Built and operated by the European Space Agency, ESA, as part of the Cassini Hygens mission and became the first spacecraft to ever land on Titan and the farthest landing from Earth a spacecraft has ever made. The probe was named after the Dutch 17th century astronomer uh, Christian Huygens, who discovered Titan in 1655. The combined cassini Hygens spacecraft was launched from Earth on October 15, 1997, and the uh, Hygens separated from the Cassini op orbiter on December 25, 2004, and landed on Titan on January 14, 2005. This is the only landing accomplished in the outer solar system, so it is also the first landing on the moon other than our own. It touched down on uh, land, although the possibility that it could touch down in an ocean was also taken into account in its design. The probe was designed to gather data for a few hours in the atmosphere and possibly a short time on the surface. It continued to send data for about 90 minutes after touchdown. It remains the most distant landing of any human-made craft. On January 14, 2008, Messenger made the first of three flybys past Mercury as it works to enter orbit around the innermost planet. The Messenger spacecraft flew by Mercury at 200 kilometers altitude on uh, 1904 GMT time. This changed the craft's solar orbit uh, to 0.32 to 0.70 AUs, lending a further lending to further and a final orbit capture in 2011. And one of my favorites and one of the most spectacular missions, uh, manned missions, was January 15, 1969, the Soyuz 5 spacecraft. The most spectacular survived space failure is launched. Soyuz 5 was a Soyuz mission uh, using the Soyuz 7K OK spacecraft launched by the Soviet Union on January 15, 1969, uh, which docked with the Soyuz 4 in orbit. This is the first ever docking of two manned spacecraft of any nation and the first ever transfer of a crew from one space vehicle to another of any nation. The only time a transfer was accomplished with a spacewalk two months before was the U.S. Apollo 9 mission performed the first ever internal crew transfer. The flight was also memorable for its dramatic re-entry on January 18th. The craft's service module did not separate, so it entered the atmosphere nose first, leaving cosmonaut Boris Voyne hanging by his restraining straps. As the craft aero braked, the atmosphere burned through the module, but the craft righted itself before the escape hatch was burned through. Then the parachute lines tangled and the landing rockets failed, resulting in a hard landing which broke Vonya's teeth. Now that's all he has in this uh, report, but what had happened was the spacecraft was so far off course that it landed somewhere, I believe it's Siberia. He literally, after he came to, he was knocked unconscious as well as his teeth knocked out. He was able to leave the spacecraft. He walked to a small cabin somewhere in the middle of nowhere where uh, a, a, a villager, somebody out in the middle of nowhere was able to uh, help him. It would be another uh, several hours before helicopters would come to pick him up. It was very dramatic. There's a, a number of uh, interesting stories about his uh, uh, recovery. There was also mention, too, that the uh, mission control for 
the Russian Mission Control actually took up a collection while the spacecraft was coming back to uh, help his his uh, soon to be you know widow. So it, it was a really incredible story. All right, next up is the Astronaut Training Group 8 was selected. Uh, this is a, really has a, a number of folks that uh, were quite amazing uh, themselves. It's had a, a, an amazing class. Each year, or each uh, a few years, and there is a new Astronaut Core Group. Training Group 8 was the eighth group selected by NASA. And they have some, several interesting uh, first time and uh, special uh, individuals. Here, here's the list that he gives us. Uh, one of the most famous, of course, the first American woman in space, Sally Ride, on January 18, 1983, SBS-7. Another person from this from this uh, eighth selected group, first African American in space, uh, Guinan Buford. Uh, Bluford, I'm sorry, August 30th, 1983, first Jewish American, Judith Resnick, August 30th, 1984, first American woman to perform an EVA, Catherine Sullivan, on October 11th, 1984, first mother in space, Anna Fisher, November 8th, 1984. American in space, Ellison Onizuka, January 24, 1985, first African American pilot in command mission, Frederick Gregory, April 29, 1985, first American to launch on a Russian rocket, Norman Sagard, March 14, 1995, first American woman to make a long duration space flight, Shannon Lucid, March to September of 1996, first American active duty astronaut to marry. Astronauts, the two of them, that'd be Robert Gibson and Ray Sutton. Um, no date on that one. First mother to be hired as an astronaut, Shannon Lucid. First Army astronaut, Bob Stewart. So interesting to note that the previous seven groups that came before this class had only Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps officers and civilians, with the West Point graduates having accepted commissions in the Air Force. Of this group, Scobie, Resnick, Onizuka, and McNair would, would perish in the Challenger accident. These four astronauts plus Lucid would all receive the Congressional Space Medal of Honor, giving this astronaut class five total recipients of the top NASA award. This is the second in the nine, uh, second to the new nine class, which won seven. Nine, astronomer Edwin Hubble publishes Hubble's Law. The farther things are from us, the faster they appear to be moving away based on work by himself, Milton Humanson and Vesto Schiffer. In the proof of Stigler's Law, in which no law is named after the person who first proposed it, Hubble's Law was proposed, published in 1927 by cosmologist Georges Lemaire. Stigler's Law was, in fact, first published by Robert Merton, who named it after the Matthew effect. Hubble himself had discussed his findings in the New York Times as early as 1924. Hubble was careful to use the term apparent velocity, leaving we explaining the theoretical justification of the universe was expanding to others. Another astronaut group, 13, 13, you got to figure they've got something. They are nicknamed on January 17, 1990, the Hairballs. So uh, these names get more bizarre as time goes on with these crews, these different uh, astronaut classes, but it includes uh, Bursch Chow. Um, let's see. Oh, we don't have any first names. Well, maybe we. No. Huh. Okay. Well, I won't name them because I've got some first names, some last names, and some commas in here. They're all cool. They're hairballs.
next up is the the death of what was at the time the unknown chief designer uh, of the Soviet space pro program, Sergei Korolev. Korolev is buried in Red Square. He worked as the lead Soviet rocket engineer and spacecraft designer during the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 1960s. He was involved with the development of the R-7 rocket. That's the rocket that is used to launch uh, crews into outer space even today. It's also used for Sputnik 1 and the launching of Laika, the first human, and, uh, the, the uh, first animal into space and the first human uh, going into space. is interesting. He says, be, it says before his death, he was officially identified only as Glavani Constructor, or the chief designer to protect him from possible Cold War assassination attempts by the United States. Even some of the cosmonauts who worked with him were unaware of his last name. He only went by chief designer. Only upon his death in 1966 was his identity revealed, and he received the appropriate public recognition as a driving force behind Soviet accomplishments in space exploration during and following the International Geophysical Year. That would be 1958. All right, uh, I'm going to just uh, go ahead and go to the next section, which is normally mine anyway, uh, if the net control doesn't mind. Uh, this is heavens above. I'm not going to read a lot of these because it's a lot. Well, it's not too bad. I guess I could read these. Uh, these come from heavens-above.com, heavens with a hyphen above.com. Just plug in your longitude and latitude. You'll get this information. So the, the International Space Station makes a grand reappearance in the sky on January 20th. It's a minus 3.9 magnitude. Uh, at 5.14 a.m. out of the northwest, it will reach its highest point at 5.16.33, 74 degrees in the west-southwest, and it falls at 5.19 uh, to the south-southeast. So this is a very good pass, uh, almost overhead. There's a little note here. The North Korean satellite also has a pass on January 26th. This one is almost overhead as well. Let's see here. That one is uh, 7.0 magnitude at 5.45 a.m. out of the north northeast. Reached its highest point at 5.49 at 68 degrees and falls at 5.52. also has a good pass. This one is on January 28th, 0.7 magnitude at 1926 out of the southwest, reaches its highest point at 1930, then it falls at 1931 due east at 47 degrees. So I think this one goes into shadow. Then finally, the uh, NVSAT is a polar orbit of satellite with uh, a nice reflective capabilities. This one always has good passes every week. The two best ones, January 23rd, it's uh, 3.2 magnitude, 1919 local time out of the south, reaches its highest point at 75 degrees, uh, falls at 1929 uh, north-northwest, so that's uh, from almost south uh, to due north due south to due, almost due north. And then finally, on the 26th, it will be 2.9 magnitude at 19.07 local time, reaches the highest point at 19.12 at 81 degrees, and then falls at 19.18. So the thing about all this is, is that even though um, we have a lot of light pollution here in the Dallas area. Any object that's moving overhead, uh, you'll still be able to see any of the ones that I just mentioned. They are possible. And I remember even one time I was able to see both the International Space Station 
and the Chinese station, Tiangong 1, uh, which uh, is no longer with us as Tiangong 2 is in orbit. Tiangong 1 was going over simultaneously. That was pretty cool. Headed in different directions. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see something like that, that's really uber cool. Okay, that's it for me. I'll send this back to Net Control. This is KE5 ICX.
state. p.m. W5NC. Completely operational and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net. Net. Every uh, Saturday night we meet at 1030 to discuss some fine science fiction film or TV show. And tonight our show is uh, called Pioneer One. It's, it was a, a TV show, well, not really, it was a, a, a internet show <laughs> independently produced. And uh, we watched the first uh, part of it this week. And so I'm going to now ask Tom, can you find ICX, if you would please give us a synopsis of it. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. This is KE5ICX. I get all my information, my authoritative information from the one, the only Wikipedia. So this is what they have to say about it. I'll read a little bit about it. I thought it was pretty cool, actually. Pioneer One was a 2010 American web series produced by Josh Bernhard and Bracey Smith. It was funded purely through donations, and it's the first series created for and released on BitTorrent Networks. It was legal on BitTorrent. It was a serialized drama produced and distributed online through Voodoo and Disco Networks. Downloaded more than 3,730,000 times and since that since May of 2012 and the winner of the Best Drama Pilot at the 2010 New York Television Festival 
The show is independently produced and financed by viewer donations. The pilot episode was filmed on a budget of six thousand dollars. That's it, raised in advance using Kickstarter. The series itself was released under an a, 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 a attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, Creative Commons license, and is distributed for free in collaboration with Vudu and with Bernhardt's previous independent film, The Lion's Share over the internet, including peer-to-peer networks. Six episodes were produced. Production of the rest of the season was funded through direct donations from the fan base. Here, they do have the plot for the pilot, and this is what it says. A mysterious spaceship enters Earth's atmosphere, triggering a massive response from the American government. Since the ship was has spread radiation over hundreds of miles of rural Montana, officials are quick to bring up the possibility of a terrorist attack, specifically the detonation of a dirty bomb. However, that idea is discarded subtly by a leading investigator using the rhetorical question, who has launched an attack on Montana? Debris is found in Canada, where an investigation of the crash discovers a live human being in a Soviet spacesuit. Federal agents working for the American Department of Homeland Security get involved receiving permission from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Red Coats, to operate in Canada. The man is in an unstable condition and his initial blood work shows signs of severe cancer with his doctors proclaiming he is too badly injured for transport. A note handwritten in Russian found at the crash site says the man is a child of cosmonauts living at a base on Mars. Not believing the note and wanting to announce to a Department of Homeland Security's success to the press, the American DHS orders Amer- uh, Agent Taylor to bring the man back to the United States as a suspected terrorist, despite his severe condition. Uh, destroys the permission from RCMP forcing his team to stay on site. He also brings in Dr. Walzer, an expert who has written several books about the possibility of human survival on Mars to discuss the incident. At the end of the episode, a radio signal is heard and the screen displays a com- of a computer at Balconar Cosmodrome is shown. episodes of starting at January 16, 2010, and then the final episode was uh, released on December 13, 2011. So back in those days, it's been within the first week of its initial release, the pilot episode had been downloaded 420,000 times, 170,000 more than downloaded it was predicted on December 13, 2011, Pioneer One series had collectively been downloaded over three and a half million times through Voodoo and raised almost $100,000 in fan donations. It's hard to estimate how many other downloads may have taken place through other means, such as torrents being automatically added to the latest version of MicroTorrent. Initial reviews were positive, with many reviewers praising the show for being surprisingly good for an independent project. For example, Download Squad described the first episode as surprising. I found myself wishing there were more episodes available when it finished. The New York Television Festival celebrate, uh, selected Pioneer One as the best drama plot for their 2010 independent pilot competition, and the International Academy of Web Television nominated Pioneer One for best drama at an inaugural IAWTV Awards. So I'll end it there. Uh, Pioneer One, our bit torrented TV program this week. It's KE5 ICX back to that control. Hey, thank you, Tom. This is WV50ZL. And uh, we'll take check in, short time and low power first. Give us your call sign phonetically, your name your location, and whether or not you saw the show. So please come now, short time, low power.
for Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony, mobile, short time, did see the movie. Just by the sound of his voice, that might have been Andre N5 ABA, NT5 TM. Okay, thank you, Tony. Well, we will assume it's N5 ATB, oh, ABA, Andre. Okay, let's move on to general check in. Please come down. Q 
Kilo Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra, Billy, Sherman, yes, I saw it. Okay, uh, James, I'm sorry, I missed part of your call. Could you just repeat it for me? This is Kilo Golf 5, Papa Mike, November, James, Fort Worth, I saw the movie. Did you 5 p.m. in? Here. And they 
talk about the acting and they said the low budget. As with the acting, the low budget actually helps with the special effects. So we can talk about this later, but in mainstream TV, sci fi are used to slow motion action, big red fireballs, and CGI backdrops. This theory, or this theory's low budget means that they couldn't do any of that. Instead, the special effects is quick and brutal, and the main focus is on the people dealing with the aftermath. So maybe I'm getting ahead here. Uh, I came across that in one of the states before I forgot it. The other thing that I thought was kind of unusual here, or at least I wonder why they did it, but maybe because they, it was only a half-hour movie and they spent about 15 minutes of it talking about this uh, fellow by the name of Stanislav Petrov. And uh, the reason he was important was because he actually existed. And uh, he, he died here about... Uh, of last year, but uh, he, he was on on duty uh, at this uh, early warning system for the, uh, the where the Russians on this war, early warning system reported a missile had been launched in the United States and then followed up by five more, and he he believed these to be a false alarm. And he basically disobeyed orders against the military protocol, which is to press the button and, and set a retaliatory nuclear attack on the U.S. and its NATO allies. And this could have resulted in a large scale nuclear war. And as it brought out in the, in the show, uh, the investigation later confirmed this Soviet uh, satellite warning had malfunctioned. But they, they went on to say that he was actually court-martialed or something. He received some quite severe sanctions. But in, in reality, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, it, it said uh, he, he was just sort of demoted because if the, if the Russian high command would have made a big stink of it, then they would have just exposed them for re, for, as being the real screw-ups. But they, they spent about 10 or 15 minutes of the movie just talking, well, maybe maybe not, maybe not that much, but about 10 minutes or so of a half-hour movie just talking about this one incident. So uh, I thought that was a little excessive, but maybe they, they were trying to pad it. Anyway, so back to that KG-5P. All right, next check-in. Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Hill, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff I've not seen the movie, but do you have anything you want to say? Do you want to uh, add, or are you just monitoring? Uh, this is uh, KG5ZNJ, Frank. Um, I kind of lied. I um, I managed to watch about uh, 12 minutes of it. I just was so busy this week. I, I, I kept trying to watch it, and I kept getting pulled off of it for other things. Uh, but since this was 30 minutes, I mean, I almost watched half of it, I guess. So I can comment a little bit, and... Um, you know, they, it's, uh, it seems that there's a lot of uh, uh, Canadian content in this one, so, you know, I'm the unofficial spokes Canuck for the Dominion, so I, I, it's my duty to, to be here and listen in on this and monitor the situation. But uh, it's, um, you know, I tempered it as it's, it's very low budget, obviously, so I lowered my expectations for it. And uh, from what I've seen of it, um, I, I actually liked it. I, um, I like anything that's like a classic Twilight Zone. And, um, you know, this one very much is like that, at least from what I saw. So actually, I, I like it and I want to watch the end of it. I might even watch, stay up late, watch the end of it tonight. Uh, so, so far, so good. Um, I like the fact that they, um, they, in the beginning, they had a scene inside of a, an Air Canada jet. And um, they, they missed, though. They missed something that they should have done. If you've ever flown on Air Canada, one of the best parts about it is by law uh, or by policy, they have to say everything in English and French when it's over the PA system. And the problem is they can never have a flight crew that anybody on it can speak French very well, but you always seem to have this one person uh, who thinks they're really, really good at it and they're awful. And they get up on the intercom and they start talking loud and they're very proud of themselves and they absolutely slaughter the language and it's the funniest thing ever. 
So I wish they would have got that point because it, that's that's the best part about flying Air Canada. Um, otherwise, uh, I can't say too much else because I only watched about 12 minutes. So uh, back to net control. This is Kilo Golf 5. Zombies need jobs. Okay. All right. Uh, KF5 TSK Pearl. Go ahead. This is KF5 TSK. Well, you know, there was one thing about the whole movie that bothered me is that uh, it was almost like one day he would be Homeland Security, the next day he would be the Department of Defense. And I know that they don't combine, and he didn't look like law enforcement. But, but why would the Department of Defense have, uh, you know, an office? That, it's like, who are these people? How do they get them together so fast? Uh, another thing that really struck me as odd about this whole movie, they kept talking about a nuclear battery, and I was like, uh, it would have made more sense if they had been talking about a nuclear reactor. Uh, well, the, you know, the battery came apart, and, you know, for miles there was radiation, and uh, they didn't really, you know, get into that. But uh, I found it very enjoyable that uh, 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 you know, I think the actors, you know, really played their parts in a uh, very authentic way. Uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. Can't buy a PSK back to that. Okay, next up, KE5 ICX Tom. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. You know, I, I picked this out. This, this uh, was one that I picked, and, and I remember seeing this in 2010 when it first came out. Gosh, that's been eight years ago now, but uh, I, I thought it was quite fascinating. It was really cool, too, because they were leveraging the old BitTorrent thing so you could download the thing relatively quickly and be able to watch it. And I thought that uh, it, I wasn't sure what to expect, and especially when you're talking about a series like this. So, but what I really found intriguing and what I really enjoyed about it was is that they, the, the story really uh, hooked you. It was something that you went, wow, this is really cool. And um, the Philip Joyce uh, Farmer uh, thing that uh, Mike brought up, I, I remember I, I didn't read the story, but I knew the, the basics of it. That did come to mind that that would be kind of what was going on here and the big mystery that went with it. I thought that was pretty cool. The um, story, the pilot moved along quite well. I watched the second episode. I've not watched any of the others, at least not in the last eight years, so I've got to go back and review. I'm happy that somebody went through all of them, uh, that there were six. At the time that I watched it, these were coming out uh, separated by many months in many cases, or, or a month or two, and so I got derailed. I didn't get to see them all. Now they're all available. I, I didn't even know how many there were until I read the wiki just now, that there were a total of six. So I thought it was, it was quite entertaining. I thought the acting was, uh, well, we'll get to acting, but I thought the story was really intriguing and had some real hooks to it. But as Tony mentioned, I think it needed a little more as far as plot twists and background to really take it to the next level. Uh, KE5 ICX. Okay, uh, KC5 OZT. Uh, Carol, you did not see the movie. Do you want to make comments or are you just going to monitor? Well, I'm going to monitor, but uh, it's sounding... Interesting enough, um, next week I'm, I'm going to find time to watch it, uh, KC5 OZT. Yeah, I'm thinking you would enjoy it, Carolyn. Okay, W5 EBB David, go ahead. I've watched uh, uh, the first episode and halfway through the second episode, and I like it so far. It may deteriorate over future episodes, but uh, so far I like it. Uh, now, I, I just looked up uh, the uh, the uh, Soviet Cosmodrome, and uh, th that is also an actual facility. 
I looked it up on uh, Wikipedia, and there's an interesting <laughs> YouTube spy plane photograph of uh, R-7 launch pad in uh, Tiger Ratum. It's a very interesting picture. You might want to go to Wikipedia and look that up. It's the Baikonur, B-A-I-K-O-N-U-R, Cosmodrome. Uh, very interesting. Now, at the beginning, uh, there are two comets, it looks like, quote-unquote comets, uh, seen from the aircraft. So I guess what that second one was will be further developed in future episodes, perhaps. Now, if, if one of them supposedly hit the airplane, that would be a rather... Uh, uh, unlikely occurrence that that trajectory would just happen to hit the airplane, or maybe it was the radiation that knocked out the, the avionics. So maybe we'll find that out later. Now, one thing where this this uh, might this uh, the overall plot might hit the mark, and in, in both the first episode and the second, there's the issue of requiring these people they bring in to sign a non non disclosure agreement, a conf confidentiality agreement. And uh, that, that is, is very much uh, reality uh, for most gov government agencies, for, their, for all employees. In fact, it's now required for employees of uh, the National Weather Service and NOAA. Now, of course, this might, uh, you know, you abdicate your right to free speech. I mean, uh, you know, it's, you know, Congress can pass no law prohibiting free speech, but if you sign a contract, even if it's by the government legally, you are bound to it. So you're abdicating your uh, constitutional right when you do that. And that is a precondition for many government jobs these days, just FYI. And I'm sure that will warrant a uh, asterisk next to my name. <laughs> but uh, so far, it's, it's interesting. And there's a few little, uh, little uh, interesting points when the uh, Dr. Uh, Walzer uh, refuses to sign it, but he's, he's, uh, he's walking through describing how you could live on Mars by living off the land. As he's first describing that, he pauses at the water fountain and has a drink. So implying, of course, that there is water on Mars. Uh, but so far, I enjoyed it. It's a good plot. W5EBB. KG5 PM, and I'm kind of, I rather enjoyed the movie, um, even though it was a low budget, I didn't know it at the time, but, um, it was kind of a, kind of a simple plot, I thought that, uh, since it didn't have a ending, or since it was a continued series, and they didn't have to have an ending on it, and so it was kind of open-ended, but, it was a rather good plot. The only thing I didn't understand was when they were running toward that one column of stuff coming up, not knowing how far away it was and how long it would take them to run there. That was kind of strange. But uh, And I also kind of wondered about the all the concrete uh, bunker-type things, but I guess with a low budget, they could film it in any concrete building and have it come out good. KG5 PM in, back to the net. Go ahead. This is KG5 BZW. Um, yeah, I, I, it was intriguing. Um, not perfect. Um, I, I, God, I hate to, to, to harp on it too much. Uh, there are just a few things. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, the uh, maybe that was part of the mystery of the show, but it uh, did they actually explain that the 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 aircraft uh, um, and you know passengers were well, was that was that did they actually claim that crashed? I I, I thought they didn't really quite explain that. Um, they mentioned the aircraft. They what did they mention? I'm not sure exactly what they mentioned. Like, it was it was just the way they described it. It was like, well, okay, something crashed, um, but was it the 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 passenger uh, 
Pastor Jay. I, I wasn't really sure about that. I kind of assumed they were just witness. Um, and but my 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 comment may, basically more or less is well they could have, they could have tighten it up and they really kind of I didn't think it, it would be any beneficial to any mystery aspect of it to to, to hide that information. You know that's kind of part of the, the reveal. Um, secondly, um, uh, I didn't quite believe the the professor. Um, just kind of, uh, I thought the pre- professor was very skeptical at first, and well, part of it was. I, I, let, let's 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 be honest. It's, it's the the time frame to uh, develop how he transitions from leaving to uh, from you know being total skeptic to yeah, this could be something. Not there's not there's really enough time in in, in the the movie. Uh, time frame to, to to really develop that, so uh, I can I guess that's forgivable. You got you have to work with it and uh, what uh, you got you have got, and, and that was uh, apparently <laughs> that's all they had. Let me reset. But uh, overall, uh, uh, those are I guess my two main harps. Uh, the uh, overall is. I thought it was good enough to watch. I do have intentions to watch at least the next episode. Um, not really hoping to watch a, a, a degrade, degradation of, you know, the original uh, plot point and all that. But uh, it, it's definitely uh, intriguing. And, and you know, uh, for what they, especially, you um, know, I didn't know that they had spent so little on this episode, but goodness, for six thousand dollars, that that's it was good for for uh, as as little as they uh, spent, I would say. Anyway, uh, that's all I got for now. This is you Five BCW. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, I watched the first two episodes, uh, and I kind of watched uh, most of the first one again. I was trying to go back and watch it the second time, but Skynet started. Uh, so, yeah, I enjoyed this. I was very surprised that they did this for $6,000. I thought it had great production value. Uh, it definitely doesn't look $6,000, that's for sure. Uh, I thought it was really intriguing. Uh, they spun out just enough to bait the hook. Uh, to make you want to watch more. So I went ahead and watched the next episode. I fully intend to watch the whole season just to see how they how they play it out, how they do the reveals. I thought they told just enough to get everybody intrigued and engaged, but left enough to the imagination to make you want more. So I thought it was very well done. As I like uh, I liked the plot. It's very intriguing. So I want to see where they go with that. I uh, wish they could do a, a second season. So we'll see how the first season plays out. Uh, I, I also found the subtlety of him stopping at the water fountain very, very a nice touch. Uh, I was just like, ooh, yeah, that was that was really subtle and, and nice there. That was that was a, a nice addition. But yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, the plot. Uh, I think it's very intriguing. Uh, you know, so. Uh, I didn't find anything wanting. Of course, you know, you, it's a pilot. you got to remember, anything you find wanting, it's like, come on, you know, they're just getting things started, so they may play more off of things, you know, hopefully later on. You know, they're going to not, they didn't, you know, dish out too much or reveal too much. I thought they did just a nice, tasty little sample just to get you to come back. So I thought it was very well done. Uh, and I enjoyed it. So uh, with that, I've, I agree with everything that was said, so I really don't have much to add. So with that, I'll return it to you. This is KFI PDF, back to net. Okay, very good. All right, well, it's my turn. Um, I've never heard of this. I 
had never seen it. He was uh, pleasantly surprised. It took a few minutes to grow on me. It was just like, you know, another school project, and it's a kind of rough cut, and the acting is not stellar, and, and uh, the jerky camera movements bothered me. But it grew on me, and the story certainly carries it. Um, it despite the, the, the whole plot holes, uh, it's intriguing, and they, I think they got better. I watched the second episode as well. It gets better. So um, I'm really looking forward to see the re seeing the rest of them. Okay, do we have any more check-ins?
and uh, the 47 language chick, uh, they kind of reminded me a little bit. It was almost like the X-Files. I don't know if everybody else got that vibe, but it was uh, a little bit like that in my head. It was. I almost felt like they were trying to copy a bit of that. But uh, the thing that really cracked me up about Captain Bedhead was, um, if anybody caught it, he had this laptop at the beginning, and he had the world's biggest Homeland Security sticker on it. I mean, it just plastered the entire... Uh, you know, top of the laptop, you know, and it, nobody would ever do that. And the guy, I used to work in the federal government in Canada you know, years ago, and then, you know, nobody would ever do that. You don't advertise like that. But, um, you know, I kept thinking of Captain Deadhead in the boardroom in a really tense debate where he's arguing the point and other people are trying to shoot him down, and his trump card is uh, he'll pull out his laptop and show that logo and say, yeah, well, let me ask you something. You got one of these? <laughs> didn't think so. And the argument's over. Uh, back to net control. KG5 ZNJ. Okay, I also uh, actually commented on the Mulder and Scully thing myself. That's what I, I kind of felt that's where they were, what they were trying to do with that. <laughs> KF5 TSK Pearl, go ahead. FKFIPSK. Well, I, I think everyone really, you know, played their part. It wasn't really anything uh, scientific or uh, something new or unusual. It was, uh, you know, they were just government employees playing their part. And, um, you know, they most, you know, looked apart. You know, with some of them they had jobs, it seemed like, you know, would the government really hire someone just to, uh, I mean, have a whole department to bend and change uh, what was reported in the news? Can't find PSK back to that. this was a terrorist, 
Uh, and then he didn't fall in line with that. He was actually trying to investigate what was going on, and that was not realistic. He would have been fired, and somebody would have replaced him who was a little more amenable to the uh, desired narrative. Uh, Walter was interesting. I mean, he was he was uh, giddy about the whole thing uh, because it uh, gave some credence to uh, the possibility of of uh, uh, a man on Mars. Uh, you know, of course, all of it looks good on paper, but uh, whether it's realistic or implementable is another question. But uh, maybe that will be explored uh, further along. Um, I was reading a little bit more about that uh, uh, cos uh, Cosmodrome. That is, of course, still actively. That that is the only launch site that supplies uh, the ISS currently for manned and unmanned missions. Uh, and maybe this will tie into the story. But uh, in the 1990s, mass animal deaths, birds and wildlife, were observed, and people in the local village of uh, Elliptian uh, were dying of stroke or cancer. And it was tied to the UDMH fuel used in Russian rocket engines, highly toxic. And even today, about 11,000 tons of space scrap metal are on the ground, and it's part of the local economy to recover that. So I don't know if that will tie into the story of the, the Martian guy, uh, whether that's how and why he has cancer, or maybe he just got used to breathing methane instead of oxygen, and, and uh, maybe that was it. But I'll certainly watch the rest, rest of these episodes. It, it looks pretty good. Uh, W5EBB. This is KG5 PM, and um, I enjoyed the characters in there. I thought they looked pretty much straight up, up and up, like people going about their business, um, trying to work through a disaster type situation. Uh, the Homeland Security guy, I think I caught a comment about he didn't know how long they were going to have to stay awake, and that may have been part of his uh, rubbing his eyes and everything because they'd been he'd been up for way too many hours um but uh they didn't seem to be too confusing and didn't seem to be doing a whole lot of jumping around with uh various scenes and, and certain different people and various scenes that could confuse me or com could could confuse the uh anybody watching the show kg 5 pm in back to the net This is KG five BZW. Um yeah the characters. I I'm really not sure what to say. A lot of uh a lot uh, <coughs> closer to here. A lot that I think I would have said has already been said. Um, the more I thought about it, uh, the more I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if that's just kind of uh, is some things I'm noticing are just kind of the strategy of uh, storytelling they employ to uh, get this uh, uh, story going. Um the uh, well, it's. Uh, I feel like I'm. I'm wanting to comment on, on characters, but it seems like every every single comment I'm I'm thinking of really more goes back to plot. It, it's more just about like um. There's good and bad aspects to being kind of thrown in the middle of things. Which is exactly what this this uh, the, the first episode does. Um, so you know we, we don't even quite know what kind of rank um, the um, <laughs> Captain Bedhead is and and all that in relation to other folks and and all. But uh, again, you know it's like you don't want to be overloaded with that kind of information anyway. You kind of want to be gently introduced. So that's not. It really was a, you know, I can't complain too bad about that. Um, it did. 
I, I'm honestly thinking of watching the first episode again just to notice the interplay a little bit more. Because there's there's a lot to that, which was good, you know, something to kind of mow over while you're watching it. And uh, there's enough of, there was enough of that that I'm kind of thinking I might have missed a few things in watching that episode. So I'm kind of thinking once I start watching this this again, I'm going to actually watch the first episode again just to see if I've if there is something I've missed, and then. Know, to carry on with that, but uh, um, otherwise, uh, I can't think of anything. So, like the next control, this is KG5BG3. Okay, I'm back. Okay, Yeah, at first, uh, when I first saw the the episode one, I thought the characters were a little stiff, uh, and but there was some good banter back and forth. That's why I wanted to. Also, I agree with Jay. I was wanting to go back and watch it a second time, uh, but I didn't get to get very far into it before Skynet started. Uh, but yeah, it in upon second viewing, it seemed to be you know a little bit easier to kind of get with them. And in the second episode, the characters do mesh a little bit better. So. I think they they may have been going for the impression that you know they're all maybe new working with each other, don't know each other yet, so it's still a little stilted, not really relaxed, and and so that the characters kind of came across a little stiff. But uh, it did get better in the next the next episode, so I think that just kind of conveys that now that they're starting to work together a little more as a team, you know, starting to view each other as a team, uh, then the the acting will probably. And, and characters will probably smooth out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I agree with the, the big Homeland Security seal. I was reading on the back of that, and I was like, really? You would put that on the back of your laptop? I don't think so. So, um, yeah, I kind of had a, a doubt about that. And I honestly thought the comment about the 47 languages was meant to be a little bit of a joke. I don't know, maybe it was not meant seriously, but I'd have to go back and watch it again a second time uh, to make sure, because there may be a, a joke there or an inside joke that we're not privy to, um, or he may have been totally serious. I don't know, but if, upon first viewing, it seemed serious, and then I got that far into it. The next time, and her comment, the way she kind of said something about 47 languages, I thought maybe she was looking at him like, really? You know, uh, so maybe that was her kind of questioning, but uh, maybe I'm just misreading it because I was kind of tired when I watched so. Anyhow, um, yeah, I, I like the characters. I think we'll get to see more as the as the the role unfurls, uh, as the the series un, unfolds. And uh, but I thought they all played well together and uh, made for interesting dynamics. So with that, I'll return it to you. This is KFI PDS. Back to Matt. IMS JJ and uh, Carlton is listening in. Uh, he's on Echo Link, but he can't transmit, so we'll put him in for the count. Okay, yeah, I'm involved with the woman. Um, there just wasn't any focus there. Um, she said, boy, well, she speaks 47 languages, and her job seemed to be to carry folders around and answer the phone, uh, and they never really described her her role in this very well. Um, I wish they had given her a little more of a, a you know, part of the team or um, maybe a brilliant scientist or something. And um, I do all the characters just kind of walk on stage and you're on the team, sign this. They can realize you'd really go through uh, a background check and criminal back criminal checks and security clearance before they let you work on a something that is this secret. So, um, but nonetheless, when it was over, I couldn't wait to see the next one, and I'm ready now to see number three. So, they're, it's good enough to hold my attention. 
Well, you know, the only thing that I really found uh, sort of irritating through the whole, uh, well, all the episodes was, uh, you know, the ads, you know, was give money to Voto or Disco, and there, there was one episode that there was a request to give money to a charity, and I thought that was just really odd, and um, I don't know, you know, why it was there, but um, or even on YouTube, you know, why, you know, commercials were still in it if, um, you know, I had to do it to see how much money that it, it cost to produce. Uh, and I'm sure the actors would have liked to be, to be paid, but uh, it, it it just seemed to be strange that in the middle of something for uh, uh, YouTube that they would, you know, stop and it's kind of like, please send us money. Came back to this, came back to that. Yeah, you're in the section I always like, which is the technical part, because they're not smart enough to be able to have, like give you a real good dissertation on plot and characters, but you can watch something on the screen and go, eh, that's not right. So, uh, yeah, the, the first thing I noticed, which was mentioned earlier, is the, is the sound. Uh, the hard rooms, uh, obviously they were doing these in real buildings, and as such, uh, if you're going to use the actual sound, bad things happen. There's even one scene where uh, uh, Cap Captain Bedhead actually is walking down, uh, walks into a room, he talks to a group of people who say, what are we going to do next, and he walks out. And there's a 60 cycle hum. Somebody didn't get the microphone quite plugged in, or he was using a, one of those uh, wireless mics, and there was noise caused by something feeding back through at 60 cycle. That was a problem. It was very noticeable. Now, uh, oh, and Tony mentioned that. One of, the, one of the things I thought was interesting, I watched um, uh, last week, and this is just sort of a, a side thing, I watched the final episode of the seri series that we watched last week, which was Star Trek Continues, and they were running um, one of these uh, group watches that you can do on Facebook, and they had Vic Von Tanya on, the guy who played Kirk in it, and he was mentioning some stuff about the show. They had a planet set that they did, very much like the original series, where the actors are on this planet and they uh, interact and there's a fight and all that stuff. Well, the thing about it was he mentioned it was just an off-the-cuff comment, which was he, that they had to dub every single line in that scene because the... Uh, the, the set was had so much in the way of echoes in that. And the thing about it was is it was so natural and, and you didn't notice it that they had dubbed it so well and so succinctly. Everything was synced up exactly the way it was supposed to that I never even thought that it had been redubbed. And I think that's one of the problems with amateur productions is, is it takes you out of the out of the, the story like five 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 one two one two on telephones. Uh, that audio just pulls you away from the story, and then you you, you suddenly have to manually re-engage in your own head. Now, I did notice in the second episode that the sound did get better. The other thing, of course, is lighting. How do you how do you make that happen in a way that that people are going to uh, 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 believe it, and even the professionals uh, don't get it right. There was a TV series called Torchwood, which was uh, a spinoff of Doctor Who, and it was an excellent series, but it was darkly filmed. And they discovered, they, they actually did, it wasn't filmed, it was video, uh, high-density video, or high-definition video, which is what everything is today, but it was one of the first shows to go to HD video. And in the process of 
producing the first episode or two, they were not satisfied with the picture quality, and they had to go back and refilm the entire first episode, maybe the second one after that. So even the pros get it wrong uh, when you're working with technology or working with stuff that you're not entirely uh, comfortable with, and I think that's what happens in these amateur productions. I thought the second episode really picked up and looked much better and sounded better and the characters gelled. I'm with everyone else. I don't mind going back and, and seeing the rest of these episodes simply because I couldn't see them in the, in the order that they were done and the time frame they were done. And I didn't lose, it wasn't that I didn't lose interest, it's that they did not release them on a regular basis, so I forgot about them, quite honestly. But overall, I thought it was quite good. I, I enjoyed it. I liked the series and, that I saw the first couple of episodes, I think. I'll go back and watch more. KE5 ICF. David. It's it's interesting that the quality of this was so good, as others have noted, for such a small budget of six thousand dollars. And uh, looking at uh, Wikipedia, it says that they needed to raise an additional twenty thousand to cover the next three episodes. So that's twenty six thousand dollars for four episodes. Uh, but they raised a hundred thousand dollars through fan donations by December 2011. So that leaves in excess of $74,000, I guess, for the last two, episode, two episodes. But here's the kicker. They announced that they would begin accepting bitcoins for donations February 11, 2011. At that time, the price of bitcoin in dollars was 50 cents. On December 2017, that price was $3,695 per Bitcoin. So if you take, uh, let's say, $25,000 of donations, if they had sold whatever donations, if they got all of it in Bitcoin or they converted it to Bitcoin once they got it, that $25,000 would be worth $308 million. Uh, and uh, $100,000 would be worth over a billion dollars, right? So... Um, Maybe they got their money back. W5EBB. Interesting. Well, if they shared it with actors that didn't make much, uh, and other people who weren't paid much. Okay, q 5 PMN, James, go ahead. This is KG5 PM, and um, I didn't see a whole lot of special effects in it that I really noticed. Uh, the opening sequence with the, the spaceship or meteor, that looked pretty good, but the only thing that I didn't really care for was that, I guess when they were run, trying to run to the, get to the crash site, that didn't look really very good, and I um, always kind of wondered about why it was so dark when they were going down, I think, to look at where the Russian where the Russian was back in, I guess, type of quarantine. Um, you know, all those downstairs uh, concrete rooms seemed awfully dark. KG5 PM in, back to the group. Hey, KG5 EZWJ. This is KG5BZW. Uh, <clears throat> don't really have uh, much for for this round because um, uh, every I like literally everything I can think of has already been covered. Um, uh, I, I literally am grasping my straws to, to come up with anything, so uh, I just turn it over to the next one. KG5BZW. Oh, uh, sorry. I don't have anything really to add. I guess, you know, I thought special effects were good, sparingly used, obviously, because of a low budget. Uh, but uh, 
I don't really have anything else to add. I, you know, was uh, listening to everyone else's comments and and enjoying those. So I'll just return it back to you. It's KFI PDS back to now. Well, I thought that, you know, special effects were adequate. Uh, that wasn't a real inherent part of the, the show, I think. The, the story is the thing in the show. Uh, the music was surprisingly good. Not sure who did it or uh, what else they did, but I was surprised how well that worked. Okay, any new check ins? Okay, I got that is Kilo Golf 5 Delta Bravo Alpha. If I could get a name, please, and uh, tell me if that call is correct. Okay, the name is Rich, and yes, that call is correct. I'm here in the North Dallas area, not far from Richardson. Did you see the movie? Now, which, what title of the book are you referring to? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's called, um, uh, oh, my gosh, I forgot. <laughs> Pioneer One. It's, it's past my bedtime. Um, are you, are you familiar with this net that we do every Saturday night? We have the blue movie net? Yes, I have listened to it a couple of times. So I'm just getting back on the air because I've been looking for a job and stuff. I just last weekend re flashed my radio to report the area, so I'm just getting back in the game again. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you joined us. Uh, Pioneer One is a, a TV show, well, not a TV show, an internet show. Uh, a series of six episodes and a uh, low budget homegrown thing. Um, so, if um, have you ever seen it? No, I cannot say that I have. Or if I have, I probably yeah, it's probably lost somewhere in my mind because I've seen a lot of internet too. All right. Well, we're going to take one. I'm not going to go down the list. If you have anything to add, just jump in, and uh, we'll go through the rotation of those people, because I think we pretty much beat this horse. Please come now.
next week's movie is, if you're fall asleep or otherwise. I actually uh, have a, a, you can go ahead and uh, send me an email at my call sign, Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray, KE5ICX at yahoo.com. Say you're interested, I'll put you on the list, and then you'll find out what the next movie is. Also, uh, you can uh, sign up via Facebook if you want, After Cool Movie, After Cool and Movie. Those are two different words. And... So you'd like to be a part of it, and then you'll get the list. And then there is a, a series of movies and TV shows listed there that you can uh, uh, peruse. And I, I give you the next couple of movies as well. I try and do it two weeks in advance. So if you run out of, out of uh, time, which happens to a lot of us, you can actually go ahead and view this stuff up front. So that's it for me. Uh, 7-3, everybody. I had fun. KE5 ICX clear.